Hey everyone, Tracy here. I'd like to thank our sponsors once again for making this event possible. Um, I'd like to introduce you now to Grace Chi, who is the co-founder and COO of Pulse Drive, a very cool threat intelligence platform. Grace has also spoke at last year's Diana Initiative and will speak today on the human side of CTI networking. It's all yours, Grace. Hey, thanks, Tracy. Thank you for the introduction. As mentioned, this is my second year and I'm so happy to be back. I am repping the TDI shirt from last year um, and so glad to be welcoming viewers from, from what I've heard. It's Discord, StreamYard, YouTube, LinkedIn, and probably some other platforms. A couple housekeeping rules. Uh, we will try to keep an eye on all the different chat, but if you have comments, if you want to interact, do start by going into the Discord Q&A channel. That's the one that I'm keeping track of, as well as the StreamYard slash YouTube. All right. So my talk today for the virtual TDI conference is Sharing is Caring, the deeply human side of CTI networking. And today in our talk, we'll lay the groundwork for some fundamental CTI basics. What's the domain? who's working in it, what does it mean? And then dig in a little bit deeper into research that I completed earlier this year and published about the human to human collaboration, the sharing that people are doing in order to support their CTI program objectives. All right, a little bit about me. Tracy did a great job in introducing me. I am three things. One, I'm the co-founder and the COO of Pulse Dive. We are a threat intelligence startup that is focused on supporting the collection, enrichment, uh, analysis, and automation of threat intelligence data across teams of all maturity levels. I also, when I'm not working on Pulse Dive, love playing really difficult, really stressful board games. And so in the third bubble you see in the formula, that is a uh, character called Spread of Rampant Green in the Spirit Island cooperative board game. If you have a favorite board game, drop it in the chat. I always love hearing and giving recommendations. And then finally, in the third bubble, uh, if I'm not playing board games, I'm not working on Pulse Dive, you can find me creating art. This succulent pot garden is actually a watercolor. And you can see it here. It's real. It's mine. Um, and it's watercolor paper in a 3D pot with stones. I see somebody said Spirit Island is the best game, and I totally agree, and I'm excited to play the new expansion that came out last month. So anyway, introduction aside, I wanted to get into the bottom line up front. What I'm here to talk to you about today is how CTI networking is an asset and not an afterthought. But before we get into some of the specifics, let's get everybody on the same page and say, what's CTI? Uh, there was some talks earlier today about intelligence and threat modeling, and that's great because that's all related. But if you want to drop in some details, some phrases that you're familiar with related to what you've heard around threat intelligence, throw it in the Discord now. And I see there's a lot of chatter going on. I see a lot of people have passionate comments about board games, and I would like to talk to you after, after I finish the presentation. And another thing that we're going to do just for a little bit of fun to spice it up, make sure you're paying attention to the screen, is we're going to have a big cat safari. And you'll see in the bottom of my screen here, there's one of the Pumas, which is from the Diana Initiatives art this year. I asked the team earlier, they don't have a name for it. So if you want to give it a good name, a fitting name, uh, let me know and I'll try to refer to it as our new pet. And you can find this Puma on six different slides in this presentation. It might be tricky depending on what screen you're looking at. It might be semi-transparent, it might be upside down, but it will always be this cat. All right, let's get started. So what is cyber threat intelligence? Go to any vendor, go to any major analyst group, and you'll find slightly different definitions. But we'll go with Gartner because they're a big leader in the space. And they define threat intelligence as evidence-based knowledge, including context, mechanisms, indicators, 
implications and action-oriented advice about an existing or emerging menace or hazard to assets. A lot of words. This intelligence can be used to inform decisions regarding the subject's response to that menace or hazard. And no matter where you read a definition, it really boils down to a couple of key components. It's data that gets contextualized that then informs action. And what's really important with threat intelligence and where the market is today is clarifying what threat intelligence is not. The ones listed here get conflated with threat intelligence, but threat intelligence is a program. It's a process. It takes time. So it doesn't mean you have threat intel, CTI, if you have a notebook with every threat group or APT being tracked, like a dossier. It doesn't matter if you just have a lot of expensive feeds and expensive tools. It's not having a dedicated team member or a provider for threat intel, even though that's obviously very important. It's not ingesting every indicator you can find or OSINTing all the things, even though there are great free tools, OSINT tools, and a lot of research being done around indicators, which are like domains, URLs, hashes. And most importantly, which I alluded to earlier, CTI is not setting it and forgetting it. It is not something that you plug in and then you kind of let it go live and suddenly it's on its own. It takes a ton of human intelligence, human work and curation to make it really work for an organization. But it is that fundamental layer of knowledge and centralized repository for what you're looking at related to your organization or your own threat landscape. So now that we've talked about what it is at a high level, where is it taking place and, and who's doing threat intelligence? Most organizations, based on a SANS Institute survey from last year, reported that they had some sort of formal dedicated team or some sort of shared responsibility across security groups. And that could be like SecOps, incident response. And what you'll see here is that over half had a combination of in-house and service provider. Uh, the amount of in-house only CTI teams went up 5% and became 36% last year. So that's trending upwards. And then there's a small proportion that has just service providers. So CTI, professional services, consulting, that's doing the bulk of their work. And now this was a snapshot across all organizations that SANS had surveyed. But what kinds of companies does CTI take place in? The first are ad vendors. These are products, large and small. These are startups uh, creating tools or services. Um, and this is great because a lot of times you're at the cutting edge, you're developing new technology, you're really working with a lot of customers and understanding where the market is going next and what you need to do, what tools need to be made to support those processes and those people working on CTI teams. Then there's consulting. And that could be big four, that could be small local MSPs, MSSPs that have some CTI services that are being built out. And that's professional services where you, if you're working as a CTI analyst or practitioner, a lot of the times you're getting paid hourly on certain client engagements. And they're great to get exposure to different environments and understand the business value behind CTI. But it can be uh, pretty stressful and it can be challenging working on that client service side. Of course, there are government entities, military, federal, local, state, that are building out CTI capabilities to protect their citizenry, protect their departments, understand what threats are facing uh, their specific uh, attack surface. And then finally, I'll wrap institutional and commercial together because that's traditionally seen as the in-house security team. That means that there's a security team that's protecting corporate assets or nonprofit assets, and that could be for uh, academic universities and schools, healthcare like hospital networks, and then commercial for-profit companies like enterprises, right? Retail, hospitality, finance, supply chain, and manufacturing. But what those teams look like truly run the gamut. And CTI teams today, and if you can spot the Puma, please drop it in the chat. It is hiding somewhere, and I'll give you a clue if I don't see any notes uh, halfway through the slide, but keep an eye on the yellow Puma. CTI teams today 
run a full spectrum of maturity. That's what they call it. CTI program maturity. There's CTI on a budget, which I like to joke is kind of like the college dorm microwave and mini fridge built in one where they're, they don't have that much capacity. There's like a single person who also has a full different job who's starting to do CTI. They rely a lot on free and open source tooling, which is great. And they're just starting to get their feet wet into researching and analyzing threats. In the middle section, which is the biggest, because I would say this represents most CTI teams, there's a bit of a messy kitchen. And this is because a lot of CTI teams that have some resources have been doing this for a few years as CTI has grown as a space. Um, there's a lot of mess. It's not fully operationalized. Uh, data connectors are not fully in place. The, you might collect a little free tool here, a list of indicators there, some internal telemetry here, um, and don't let these phrases throw you off. But you get, you're getting a lot of stuff, but it's not all necessarily working together smoothly. And there can be, depending on how the organizations addressed their CTI program and maturing it, a lot of like a graveyard of missed projects or things that didn't quite meet their full potential. So with CTI, it's important to understand, assess where you are, the kind of next one, two steps you really need to hit strategically, and then go from there and iterate over time, right? It's not set it and forget it. Finally, mature fusion centers. This is the iron chef, master chef kitchen, where you have all the tools. They're fancy. They're on a show because a lot of times these really mature teams are not only doing a lot, have a lot of automations, have a lot of talent to support their own teams, but they're producing and sharing research that gets pushed out either publicly or within certain groups to support each other, cross-sector, cross-company. And they're, they're still always work to be in. This is not a solved problem whatsoever, but they tend to have most of their stuff together and have been doing this for a long time. Financial sector is a really good example where there's been a ton of investment because of the criticality of the assets they're protecting. I see somebody from healthcare is in here. Makes sense given your, your uh, Discord tag name. And at the bottom, I had put a few different phrases you'll see a lot related to CTI tools and kind of how you niche down. There's reporting, there's internal data, there's dark web data, sector, you can be sector specific, geographic specific, you can do manage CTI, you can enrich your CTI. And like a lot of fields in security, there's a lot. Uh, no one can do everything. And it's very important to be able to rely on others and draw from the network potentially using OSINT feeds to stay on top of the news to understand what you're doing. So understanding the fundamentals, extremely important, but do not feel overwhelmed if it's just a ton. So has anybody found the Puma in the slide yet? I'll give you five more seconds and I will let you know that it is hiding somewhere in the mess of the middle kitchen. I see some typing happening in the Discord, so I'll give you a few moments. Okay, it looks like nobody found it. It's right here up in the cabinets. And that's kind of what it'll look like throughout the slide deck. So I gave the lightest, briefest, most high level introduction to CTI. If you listened and you're not fully familiar or you want to di dive in a little deeper, I have some resources for you, highly recommended. Um, and hopefully the moderator will be able to drop some of these links in the chat, these four URLs. You don't have to go around taking screenshots and trying to do OCR text recognition. The first, if you are just familiarizing yourself, what's CTI? What does it mean to work in CTI? I would recommend Katie's Five Cents. This is a medium that has FAQs on getting started and some self-study plans, very uh, easy to follow. The second, if you're like, give me more, I want all the readings, I want a GitHub repo with a bunch of resources, I recommend Curated Intelligence CTI Fundamentals. And that link will cover not just theory, but in practice and for enterprises. Finally, if you are the type, like many security folks who are like, give me all the tools. I want all the things, paid, free frameworks, books, links, uh, channels, 
go to awesome threat intelligence. This is compiled by Herman Slapman. It's been around for a long time and it's just all the things if you want to open up 75 tabs and kind of feel your way around CTI from the inside. And finally, one of the most recent additions I've made is something Mandiant published a month or two ago, and it's core competencies for analysts. If you are like, hey, um, what does it actually mean to do CTI analyst work? It's often not entry level. There are some out there, but what, what skills do I need to position myself for a career in CTI to, to get myself the competencies? Uh, this is great and it's ungated. Thank you to Mandiant for putting it together. And it'll tell you things, not just like give, getting you specifics about like what it means to understand threats or produce intelligence and reports, but also what's effective communication in terms of business. And then it lays out some scenarios that you can read through. And it's 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 a lot of words, but it's not intimidating, very easy to follow with like four core pillars for the CTI analyst. And I love that they're trying to push together the development of CTI talent. And thank you for adding those links for us in the chat. And this is in the Discord chat. So why bother? Why did I do research about CTI sharing? To be frank, a lot of the security community and the industry always talks about how cutting edge the technology is, how fancy, how sh new shiny technologies. And coming from a vendor, coming from Pulse Dive, I do think it's highly valuable. But I also think that a lot of times we don't pay attention to the more manual, the less shiny, less cutting edge things that teams are doing all the time to support their CTI programs. And so when you look at SANS Institute, same survey from 2021, you'll see that the amount of organizations that were producing or consuming CTI went up to 85% from 60% five years prior. And the amount that had no plans whatsoever went from 15% to zero. So nobody, no organizations that responded to the SAN survey said, yeah, that CTI thing, I just, I don't think it matters for us. We don't need to work on that. We have other stuff. And the, obviously the remainder, the ones that weren't starting yet, but planning to were made up the other 15%. So the amount of effort being put into both creating and consuming threat intelligence has gone up. It's only going to continue to go up, but the problem is by no means solved. And if anyone can find the Puma, on the page. I'll give you a couple seconds before we move on. So CTI is growing. The field itself has expanded significantly. And a lot of tools have come out and they're very important. And a lot of new talent has entered. But why would I bother looking at threat intel from the human to human, one to one networking? Oh, I see somebody in here said, See the puma in the top middle. Oh, a couple of you caught it. Excellent. Yes. Very faded. Good eye. I see some screenshots in the chat too. That's amazing. Keep doing that. If you put the first screenshot in the Discord and I know your name, I will send you a sticker pack, uh, but you'll have to DM me as well afterwards. Good eye. Okay. Back to the conversation. So CTI is growing as a field, but you'll hear a lot of comments like CTI networking is untapped in organizations. We're very siloed uh, when it comes to intelligence sharing. We need better ways to share intelligence safely, cross sector, cross geography, cross private you know, companies. Collaboration is essential for us to do our work. And why does that matter? The most important thing is that at the end of the day, you hear that people will say, we never get to our level of threat intelligence maturity, of awareness, of being able to act proactively and preventatively, if we're always running around with our heads cut off, working in little silos, with our hands tied behind our back because we can't share. So what I did, and that's exactly what I looked like when I was going about this research, I have, you know, the, the spyglass, um, is that I went off and benchmarked a couple behaviors in CTI sharing from a very human perspective. One thing I wanted to be clear about is that I did not talk about networking in the sense that you might be familiar with, like getting a new job, getting a promotion, closing a deal with a customer, not that kind of networking. It had to be sharing stuff for the benefit of your CTI work. It also was not about any specific tooling. 
Uh, we did not have any interest talking vendor to vendor or be, you know, we wanted to be very solution agnostic. And so we avoided any talks about automation and, and Intel sharing. But there was a lot of work that was done in standardization like sticks by taxi. And there's a ton of research. It's not like I'm the first one here that looked at how collaboration can be improved from a policy level about trust um, and about technologies. But to me, nobody had ever gone deeper than crowd wisdom around, oh yeah, how are people sharing? Where are people looking? And really put some numbers behind it to support the value of what it's doing right now. So I did three things. One is I looked at how different methods stacked up, which we'll jump into. Then we looked at how and why individuals were participating. Why did they bother spending their time and their precious resources to do networking? And then finally, really quickly, the role that organizations played, if any. And I'll let you know now, there is a Puma somewhere on the screen. This was not one of the harder ones, so I'm sure somebody will be have an eagle eye. But my method about going about this research was in pretty much following the intelligence cycle. So I started with planning and discovery. I did a ton of research to find out what was and wasn't in scope, what people were curious about. I see somebody already spotted the Puma. That was really fast. Um, I looked at what the purpose of my research would be, started doing some academic literature research and seeing what was out there. There's some great research existing. Uh, then there was collection. I built out the survey, which you'll see screenshots of, and maybe a little cat or two. Then I distributed that, and it was mostly done through word of mouth. No compensation uh, was offered, so it was all free on my own time and dime. Then I moved into processing and analysis. So I had a survey. It was pretty long, so thank you to everybody who responded. And it was like all the pivot tables in the world. If you're in CTI, you're familiar with Excel. It was like the, it felt like the biggest Excel sheet with so many, so many tables and so many different values and breakdowns, but not just quantitatively. Um, I also did qualitative review because I had some open-ended questions. So that helped me layer insights and narratives on top of the numbers that I was seeing. Finally, um, I went out and I'm disseminating it. It came out as a report. We'll have the links later. And if the moderator wants to drop it in chat now, you could take a look. It's ungated. You don't need to share any information with me to download the research that I completed. Came out as a blog. And then I've been doing some presentations to help spread the word and share the advice and insights that I found with the, the, uh, the class. And I see there's some uh, argument going on. I'll have to go back and audit and see who, see who won this, the spotting the, the Puma. And before we dive into the insights, I really wanted to cover demographics. When you do research, it's important to know where you might have biases, where your survey was limited. And I want to emphasize that this research is very much so an initial step. It is not scientifically significant. I don't think I'd have the resources to do that on my own. But it is to give us a sense of what's out there so we can start talking about it. And when we looked at our survey respondents, I didn't collect any, like, race, age, gender data. I wanted everyone to be, feel very comfortable, but I did ask about their roles and their organizations. And what we found here is that um, most people were, you know, half CTI dedicated practitioners or related roles that made a lot of sense, like incident response, security operations, threat hunting, other research. And that's as hoped for. The years of experience also made a lot of sense. There was a good spread of people with total work experience. So that could be that they pivoted from a different field. And then the years of total, uh, sorry, the years of CTI specific experience, that was also as expected. And you'll look here and be like, well, so many people only had one to five years. Why, why is that the case? And that's because CTI is a growing field. The term CTI is relatively new. So even if you did, CTI related responsibilities before, you might not report that as CTI work. And you'll see that it's heavily new and then it fades off over time. And this makes a lot of sense because people have pivoted from other roles in security as well as other careers altogether from education to business analyst work to journalism. And because CTI is so dynamic and the programs itself require so many different types of talent working together and complementing each other's skill set. Uh, that's actually a great thing to see too. And then when we looked at the 
types of organizations, that's where we had some limitations on this survey. The vast, vast majority are for profit. So half of the vast majority, 41%, were in-house security teams. So you're protecting your corporate. Um, oh, and I see that LinkedIn live stream stopped after four hours. So please, if you were on there before, pop into the YouTube link. So um, for profit was split between in-house security teams as well as security providers. These are vendors, professional services. I would have loved to get more government respondents, but it's really tough. A lot of times they're not allowed to participate even though it's fully anonymous. Um, when we looked at organization size, the spread was pretty solid across different companies, just less than 100 to over 100,000. And then uh, finally with location, we had a strong, strong, strong majority, which makes sense, based in the US as well as Europe, a little bit from Asia, some representation across the board, but that's because it came through you know, my network and it was written in English. We weren't able to translate the survey, but it's something that I would love to do more of in the future. So let's dive into the fun stuff, the findings, now that all the disclaimers are out of the way. One thing that's not directly related to CTI networking that I love sharing was how satisfied respondents were. I didn't find any specific correlations between subgroups of people, responsibilities, org size, um, with the level of satisfaction, but I love sharing this because this is consistent with what I hear anecdotally, that CTI people enjoy their job. It's not always easy. It's not even always fun, but it's very satisfying, the type of work you're doing. And it was over 70%. There was a slight dip at those that uh, 10 to 100,000 employers, full company employers, not just the team. That would be crazy if there's a security team of 100,000 people. Um, and that is just a matter of organizational culture and growth. So if you're thinking about a career, highly, highly recommend you think about it, build up some skill set and take a look at CTI as a very serious place that you could bring your security work. All right. And there should be a very obvious cat in the picture for you here. So jump on it, chat. What we looked at when we dove into what methods, how did different methods stack up against each other? We asked questions about like peer-to-peer -peer trust groups. That's like Discord where we are today, Slack, Telegram, Signal, lots of channels. Um, there's social media and public forums. So that's Twitter, it's Reddit, it's LinkedIn, things that can be accessed publicly. There's one-to-one -one direct messages. DMs, calling you, emailing you. And then there was also industry events, like a B-Sides, like a Diana Initiative, volunteer groups and coalitions, uh, like Trace Labs or uh, National Child Protection Task Force, paid membership groups uh, like ISACs and Dark Web. So I asked, how often do you participate? And what we found is that there are no shortcuts to the strongest and most effective networks yet. These are all free, the top three peer-to-peer -peer social media and one-to-one -one direct messages. They're all free, they're all peer-to-peer, -peer, and they're really heavily based on personal reputation and contribution, what you do, not necessarily who you're tied to. But that doesn't mean that the other, you'll find that the other channels don't help. They help you create a pipeline to the right groups that you want to get into uh, that are more easily accessible, like events and volunteer groups. And so the crowd favorites, and by crowd favorites, I'm, you know, in general, if you looked at Twitter, the conversation pretty much rang true. So peer to peer trust groups, one to one DMs, and social media, I'll explain the asterisk later, led the pack across all responding groups. But not only did I ask about participation, so like how much do you do this thing? How much are you in this network? But I also asked about perception. And I was asking questions about key characteristics of CTI content. Do you think that it is valuable? that what you get out of it is high confidence, it's timely, actionable, is it unique content that you're getting? And what you'll find in this metric is that peer-to-peer -peer trust groups, one-to-one -one, one -to -one direct messages, obvious first, that makes sense, but it's also manually intensive. Peer-to-peer -peer trust groups are really strong. And social media, really volatile because it's pretty timely, it's valuable, but it's also very low confidence, not that actionable and not that unique. And I think a lot of this issue with social media is because it comes with a lot more than what is professional work. You can get all sorts of crazy feeds, you can get distracted, there's a lot of noise. And the tip that I heard here is really learn how to use advanced muting, blocking, following certain lists and curating based on the objectives you want. 
uh, you can have a separate personal and work or research following CTI account and really make sure that you're finding just the researchers, just the voices, just the intel that is highest confidence to you and most valuable, right? Because finally, even though perception of social media wasn't so hot compared to some others, the results showed that yes, social media, along with, of course, the top two peer-to-peer -to -peer trust groups and one-to-one -one direct messages, they helped real-world scenarios. I asked, did participating in these help you detect or prevent an attack? Did it help you during an attack? Did it help you during remediation or post-incident analysis and so forth? So we looked at how much people were doing things, what they thought about it subjectively, and then more or less as a proxy for objective results, what happened. And so when you're looking at CTI networking, the crowd favorites took first place and second place and third place. And then I asked, all right, regardless of channel, why are you spending your time in these spaces? And when I asked, I got a ton of feedback that said, hey, I want actionable and timely content. I want concrete stuff. And I'm going to stay for the awareness of that to help me contribute to my program, uh, to my team, my workflows. So they want valuable threat data. They want to stay aware of what's happening strategically, take proactive measures, and also find and be aware of new sources and methods that they can contribute to and bring in. But when it came to the long argument of data versus information versus intelligence, what was the highest value really depended on what kind of role you were in. And for the eagle eyes out there who are actively searching for the puma, there's another one on this page. When I asked about different types of content that provided the most value, I forced the respondents to order rank them. And overall, which is consistent with the CTI uh, primary job responsibility, contextualized information came first, then processed intelligence. And that's like a report with it, out insights, incomes, remediation tactics, reasons. Then raw data. So like a list of uh, technical indicators, atomic indicators, IP addresses, um, hashes, signatures. Then others' advice and opinions, technical support, and emotional support. Some people joke, like, why would you put emotional support on there? But when I did my initial discovery, this was a reason why people joined the networks, to know that other people were struggling or during Long 4J that everyone was working together and it made them feel less alone, um, but very much so not the most important, right? Just what we learned. Actionable, concrete, timely data content is what they want. But how that works out actually matters a lot because when I broke it down just by Incident response, raw data was first. They wanted stuff right now that they could look for in the middle of the incident, while contextualized information like trends, patterns, behavior, profiles were tied for second last, right? And then when you looked at security operations, so SecOps, uh, that completely flipped. So number one was contextualized information back up top. Process intelligence, well, raw data was dead last because what does SecOps do with raw data? It a lot of times becomes false positives or forces you to do a ton of research to then enrich and contextualize the data. So that is not highly valuable. So you have to always keep in mind who you are, who you're working with, what these groups have, and how you can contribute meaningfully. And executive leadership, of course, no surprise here, process intelligence, number one, they need to know what happens, why, and what they have to do about it. Whereas like the raw data and the technical support drop. And so you can dig into my report further to see how the years of CTI experience, size of organizations will also change these rankings. And then finally, in organizations, what role do organizations play in CTI networking and sharing, if any. For now, it's mostly on you. Uh, when I asked questions about at the workplace, employees, practitioners had said that their biggest barrier by far was time, not having enough time. And I think that this is consistent with any other project. There's just not enough time. There's a lot to do, a lot to research, a lot to work on. But then the second, the third, and the fourth reasons that were top ranking were all around sharing restrictions. And what I mean by sharing restrictions 
is like legal liability. Okay, I can't do this because the legal team will uh, not allow it. It's TLP, traffic light protocol, that determines what types of information you can share with what level of group, whether it's just your team, just your organization, just your sharing group, or public, TLP white. Anything on Twitter is TLP white. And then finally, there's a reputational issues, um, liability, or like NDAs and confidentiality agreements as well. So not having enough time and then not being able to share, even though you might want to, were major reasons why they were not doing more of it. There was limited reporting. When I asked, do you measure your success? Do you talk about what you do through networking? That didn't really take place. It was underdeveloped compared to a lot of other security uh, responsibilities. And then this was reflected in the statements that I had asked. Um, I asked questions that were personal, like, I encourage those who report to me to participate. CTI networking is essential for doing my job. CTI networking is a part of my time and responsibilities. And how much people agreed were pretty strongly in the agree range. They felt that it was important that they agreed. But then when you broke it out by the more organizational statements, like, I'm rewarded for participating in CTI networking. It's easy to get new networking methods approved. CTI networking is defined and structured in my area of work. That's where it kind of fell towards much more neutral sentiments. And that's because a lot of people simply will do the thing and not have it be attributed to the fact that they're in parts of these groups and that these groups are providing data. They, they just bring it to their work and then they get their results. A caveat is that in the cybersecurity dedicated technologies, vendors, professional services, those organizational sentiments moved a little bit more towards agree still not as strong as the personal statements, but that could be a factor of the culture and understanding about the importance in sharing for security. And so here, while there's a lot of barriers and while people aren't really measuring or talking about the efficacy of participating in CTI networking, right, sharing stuff in channels like Discord, it directly impacts top line objectives of strategic awareness, of Action, taking action, of taking preventative measures, of remediation. Um, and I see somebody in chat says, I love CTI networking. Good to have you with us. If you have any additional commentary, feel free to drop it in the chat. Um, and if we just can start to acknowledge the impact that it already has in the programs in place today and be more transparent, that can give us a lot of room to be more intentional, more inclusive to everybody who's looking at the CTI space and more strategic about what we're doing and how and how to optimize that for what your organization needs. So a couple key takeaways as we're wrapping up the presentation. CTI networking is important for team members at all level. This is important. In my survey, this was the highest consensus throughout the entire questionnaire. And there was like hundreds of questions, or 75 to 100 separate questions. There was 91% agreement on this statement. And that only went up with the more years of direct CTI experience and the more years of total work experience. One thing that I caught in the challenges that I didn't put in my survey, though, that was reflected in the open-ended part was that imposter syndrome stops a lot of people. This year, there's a lot of talks around imposter syndrome. I do want to nail the advice home about how we can accept that, understand it, and then also work around and through it. So I want you to take the advice of current practitioners. These are quotes from people who answered a question about what advice would you give others in the field from people working in the field. It's to participate, to build trust, and always be careful and strategic. The theme this year is take the initiative, right? And that doesn't mean being deeply uncomfortable, doing things you don't want to do. But if you have that interest, here's a few tips on how you can get started and do it in a way that optimizes for success. So to participate, start small. Share what you can. Have both human, so coffees, calls, messages, and automated IOC sharing interactions. Don't let imposter syndrome stop you engage from engaging. And that's what somebody in the chat is saying as well. That in and of itself is not enough. But how do you kind of reduce that fear, that anxiety? Get involved in a good community. It could be a coworker you like that's in CTI. It could be somebody that you see posting stuff that you resonate with that feel, you know, like they're aligned with your values and you can start following them. And then if you're not even ready to put stuff out there, 
right? Like if you're doing some research, but you're not ready because it's really scary to get that first blog or that first post about something related to CTI, start by finding and following people on social media or those public forums that are already working in your target areas. Surround yourself by the discourse, follow the news, understand the language, understand what people care about so you can build that confidence that, you know, we don't have to be experts, but we can be very familiar with the space. The second piece is to build trust. Trust is important in security, but in threat intelligence, it's like essential. You have to be active to develop that trust for you individually and also your organization can impact your reputation. And if you burn trust, it is so hard to recover. So always be trustworthy. Um, you will get into the top circles, the most cutting edge researchers, the, just the smartest people who are just kicking butt in their fields by contributing your own intelligence. There's nothing wrong at all with like retweeting dark reading or regurgitating, but that does not separate you. And that does not make you stand out as somebody who's contributing to the space. And as we learned earlier, personal contribution and reputation is so essential to advancing a CTI career through networking. And a big piece about developing trust is also as in CTI intelligence, right, is the name of the game. So make sure you have good critical thinking. Your conclusions are based on sound principles. Make sure that you understand where your biases are, where your limitations are. CTI, because the pace and the scope of what's being done, it will never be perfect. It will never be fully up to date. It's a work in progress. But acknowledging where those are and making sure you're not being distracted and you're not holding yourself to really high professional standards that will help you. And another piece is to provide value with the niche you're experienced in. You saw earlier that crazy spectrum of all those terminologies about different sectors, about dark web, about so many APTs and different types of scams and frauds taking place. You don't have to know everything, but if you can contribute your own existing skill set, lean into it and provide value with some sort of niche, and that could be translating across five languages. That could be writing Python scripts that saves everyone a lot of time. That could be really writing amazing reports that translate technical content into stuff executives will care about and take action on. Those are all value in the CTL world. So if you start doing that and then being able to provide that value, you can also lean and be symbiotic with other people who will be able to provide their own expertise and answer your questions when you hit something you don't fully understand. And so being trustworthy sounds really simple, but it takes a lot of effort and it takes a lot of holding yourself to high professional standards. And then finally, stay careful and strategic. Understand what your organization needs. So that means that you can go out and spend all day, months, weeks, years uh, being in these groups, but if it's not aligned to your job, it doesn't matter. And so you want to understand and be clear on those use cases, what your intelligence requirements are. You want to have a collection plan that includes this type of sharing and the content you're ingesting from a Discord or from a Twitter that can be automated, that could be manual. Because data on the floor is useless. Well, you know, if you don't do anything with the content you're spending time participating in, other than maybe emotional or technical support, it's not going to have an impact. And then trust but verify. There are cases where people were spoofing threat researchers for reconnaissance or for whatever their other malicious means. So you want to make sure that who you are networking with is vetted and that what you're sharing and what you're putting out there is correlated with the amount of trust you can put in those other audiences or with these other people. And I really appreciated the person who said, be skeptical with data shared. Of course, hold yourself to high standards. But also be generous to those who share as it can take a lot of courage and be novel. If it's the first time somebody's out there, they're not, they don't have malicious intent, maybe they're newer to the space, and they do something that is not great, if it is worth your time, you can go and provide constructive criticism, but understand and acknowledge that they are trying. Um, if they're not, if they're doing something bad, that's a whole different story. But we want to create a space where it's comfortable and people who are now leaders in their field are reposting old blogs saying, these were the mistakes that I made to try to help others. And I think being transparent about this, understanding the limitations, understanding when something's not the best or being open to improvement is absolutely essential in CTI. And then time is the most limiting factor, right? 
So select the trust groups based on impact. Not just trust groups, but anything you're participating in. There are more than enough channels in this world, more than enough places you can join in groups. But if you're struggling to find value early, move on. I personally recommend having maybe two, not more than three channels that you're really actively contributing to. You're keeping track of, you're following what's going on. You feel like everything that's coming out of there is probably relevant and that what you're putting in there is also helping the group. And then from there, you can have other channels as well, and they can change over time as your role and your company changes. But don't spend too much time stretching yourself too thin. Especially with imposter syndrome, you might feel like you want to see what's going on everywhere, but then that value isn't coming to you at the end of the day. So prune, prune, learn how to just focus on a couple key priorities based on what is providing you value. And I think we have, we're right around 45 minutes, perfectly on time. And so for closing out, and we can ask questions here as well, um, my full report, once again, ungated is on this uh, link underneath. I think if you can drop the link in the chat as well, Tracy, that would be amazing. The QR code, I promise you, leads to the report. Um, and there's one last pretty kitty on this page. Uh, if you can find it, I will send you, I will mail you some stickers. And if you wanted to get in touch, you can email me, you can follow me on Twitter, and you can connect with me on LinkedIn. And the links were just dropped in the Discord. So feel free to add those connections. Um, if you found something in, if you found a cat, then please also let me know who you are if your name is different than what's in the Discord. And uh, let's take, let's open it up for questions. Tracy, any questions that I should cover? These screenshots are hilarious. I love that some of you aren't also taking direct screenshots because you have like a phone or something on the side for Discord. And then so you have like these like skewed shots. Um, that's amazing. I'll try to see if I could get the second fastest person too. I'll have to look at my sticker stash from Pulse Dive and see, see how many we have left. Okay, so we have a question in the chat saying, have we collected demographics based on age? So we did not, I did not collect any of those like uh, really specific demographics, like what gender, what age, what race are you? But it was a really interesting question that I got a lot of early on, because the point of this research is to help be more inclusive. But at the same time, I didn't, I wanted everyone to feel very comfortable sending in the response fully, fully anonymous. And one of the questions I got after one of these presentations was, um, I'll go back up as well. When we were looking at the level of participation, right, social media was top, but then it was kind of, it wasn't consistently, you know, the best. And somebody had reached out saying, do you think it's because potentially younger generations, younger professionals are participating in things like Twitter, whereas the older folks who've been around a lot longer were more inclined to do direct messages where potentially, you know, they were hypothetically asking that, you know, teens, 20s year olds might not care about DMs because that's old school. <laughs> Sorry, I didn't mean to call anyone old. But when I dove in afterwards, and I still have all the pivot tables, right, I still have all of this research. What was interesting is that was not true. Uh, that was not true at all. The CISOs, the people on executive teams, the people with 15, 20 plus years of experience were as much participating in social media as the rest. So there was no significant difference at all, maybe a deviation of like five, 10%. And on the other side too, when it came to the people with like less than five years of experience, I think they had participated a little less in one to one DMs, but by no means was it significant. And same with five to 10 years or, you know, those intermediate stages. Because I think in the beginning, you might not have that, those many people, that network of, experts or specialists that can provide you valuable CTI content. And that's something where you can benefit by volunteering, joining these groups, and uh, really building that pipeline for those specialists that, oh, when when some sort of bear shows up in the news, you know who to ask. 
oh, when this type of technology or this type of exploit comes out, you know who to ask. And that's where one-to-one -one DMs can help save a lot of time and be very curated, but it's extremely manual and people complain about how long and how intensive it takes. But there is still the benefit, right? What we see here is that it is obviously taking the lead and then it's not something to sleep on or complain about. Any other questions from the group as we are wrapping up? Now I see a lot of people being nostalgic and feeling old. And by no means are you old. It was just a question asked by one of our viewers. One person asked a really interesting question about being an Asian woman in the IT community and the security community. And does that mean people don't take me seriously? Um, I will be honest here that there have been specific cases where I don't think I was taken seriously by a specific subset of groups, even potential customers, right, that um, would kind of even though I was leading the meeting, not necessarily let me lead the meeting. But by far, this is very minimal. And I do think that I do have, I, I'm lucky to have a co-founder role and a COO role, which might help avoid some of the challenges for different types of diverse groups and underrepresented groups in the space that I might be building up their career from being like a CTI analyst, a security analyst, moving into manager, competing for those sole roles. So as the co-founder, we're lucky at Pulsab that we could just not work with people that we don't particularly think are the right types of people who would not respect me and also really establish relationships and build foundations with the types of groups that we support and we think are doing great work. Um, if you want to talk about this further, uh, specifically one-on-one, -on -one, I'm happy to share some experiences with you, happy to share some um tactics and techniques that I have learned myself to really cut out the noise, cut out a lot of the ne negativity, not get really drawn down by the stuff that's not great because it, you know, to be honest, it does exist still. This industry has its challenges like every other industry. Um, and then really stay focused on helping the people that you trust, that trust you, that respect you to be successful. That was a good question. And then one um, other one that we got is what should people take away from this? So depending on what level of familiarity you have, I would say if you're looking at CTI as a career space, I'll go back up, all the way back up. If you are saying, hmm, CTI seems kind of interesting, start looking at Katie's blog. FAQs on getting started, just start doing some research. If you work in security operations or you're someone in an IT-ish role and you're like, CTI could be something that's interesting, more than this, I would say that you can follow along with the closeout. How you can start participating how you can find a good community, get those people, follow the right people on social media to keep an eye on what's going on in the space and find opportunities that might not exist in the traditional like LinkedIn job search or Indeed job search, wherever people are looking for these days. Uh, the CTI network is also very strong where you can find a lot of interesting opportunities, have conversations and be able to find really interesting roles or at least hear about the good roles that are out there and the types of employers that are maybe not the best or what teams are struggling and what those are to be honest and prepare yourself for success. And so CTI as an individual, you can do work uh, in the traditional organizational sense, but you can also do and get a lot and like accelerate your career by having your own blog, setting up your own honeypots, writing your own reports, creating commentary, um, making more intense types of content legible and easy to consume for others. So there's a lot, a lot of ways to do what you're comfortable with and start to create value in this very community-driven space. There's a lot of vendors, there's a lot of for-profit teams, but at the end of the day, what I love about security is how grassroots it still is. And Diana Initiative is also a great example of this. And so I'm 
really good to wrap up unless there's any other questions. I see that uh, there's some folks saying thank you, and I want to thank you so much for joining as well. Please don't hesitate to reach out to me. I'm happy to address any questions at all, any potential future directions, and shed additional insight on the slides and the content that I shared with you today. Thank you again, Grace. Um, all of Grace's links have been dropped in the Discord chat. And just to let you know, coming up next is authentic inclusion and building cultures that go beyond. Enjoy the talk. Enjoy the afternoon. <laughs>